Um, Ian, let me just show you one more piece of Emily Baden on uh, that I just think is an important piece of the fact pattern that the Alitos were never in any, um, the Alitos had security. Here she is talking about that. They have a security detail that parks in front of their house or like in front of the house across the street from them. We are four or five houses away. Um, and sometimes that detail would be in front of our house, which, you know, obviously I can't say for sure. I don't know what their motivation was, but we did take it as intimidating, especially when that same car reappeared in front of our house the day the New York Times article came out. And I don't know what else we're supposed to get from that. Let me just say, I am for anyone in public life who feels threatened having all the security they can muster and all that is available to them. It is good that he had a detail. But this moving of the car and her feeling um, called out by Mrs. Alito using her first and last name are pieces of the story not represented in Mr. Alito's interview with Shannon Bream of Fox News when the story first broke. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, the th I guess I am going to echo what Senator Whitehouse said in the clip that you played earlier, which is that the legal obligation on Justice Alito isn't just that he avoids impropriety, it's that he avoids the appearance of impropriety. I mean, that's what the Code of Judicial Ethics says. Um, it's that, you know, what the federal statute dealing with recusal said is that he avoids not just bias, but the appearance of partiality. And so you have a special obligation when you're at that level. You know, there's a lot of confusion here about, you know, maybe Alito just misremembered what happened. Who knows why the security vehicle was parked next to the house? But if you create the appearance that you're using your security to intimidate a, a, a private citizen, that is not allowed. I mean, uh, again, we are talking about the most powerful, one of the most powerful people in the country. He blames it on his wife. You may have heard the phrase Caesar's wife before, you, you, you know, <laughs> when you are that important, you have an obligation, even if you're a member of the family. Um, let me um, read this to you, Harry Littman. This is from the DOJ Justice Manual on Judicial Disqualification. Quote, any justice, judge, or magistrate of the United States shall disqualify himself or herself in any proceeding in which his or her impartiality might reasonably be questioned. It seems like we're 10 train stops past reasonable when you've got two flags also carried by the insurrectionists on your two different properties. Look, I think we're in a different country from appearance. So you're exactly right, and that's just what Alito says in the back of his hand, giving the in the letter to Congress saying, I'm not going to recuse. That's bad for the reasons White House says. But man, the he says it's not relevant what her reasons were. And there are other details that you might take as marginal, except he said them. The one justice who's ever had to resign for personal conduct, Abe Fortas, we're actually doing on Talking Feds a long series about him. Mm -hmm. The real complicating factor is he didn't tell the truth in a, in a fairly immaterial way. It, you know, Alito says briefly, it looks like it's a month. Alito says it was triggered, as you say, by this altercation that looks like it happened February 16th when there are pictures of the flag flying at January 17th. It is exceptionally grave if Alito has in any way misled, deceived, or even, as Baden says, lied to the Congress. Uh, I'm not, a, you know, we can't say exactly, but there's a big discrepancy here. A hearing is called for because it's a problem in and of itself. And as I said previously, to Ian's point, it's not just about an appearance when a flag is flying, a flag is flying, as White House says, on the most contentious social issue of the day. We, we, I think, at, at that point, he has embraced a position that, that we've gone beyond, I think, the appearance standard that we're always talking about. This is the worst, I think, of all the sort of scandals of the last several years involving the Supreme Court. There's a laziness, Amanda Carpenter, to how Alito wants to deal with bad press. Um, he monitors closely programs such as this one. I know because when I remind folks of the circumstances in which he was nominated, that he was Bush's second choice after Bush's dear friend Harriet Myers didn't survive the confirmation process. Um, uh, I know that's not a fact of his biography, that he um, 
uh, is fond of being sort of put back into uh, the Wikipedia page, if you will. Um, but he, he, in his biting remarks in the public forums in which he speaks, he often responds almost to paragraphs said by people who appear on programs such as these um, with, with very thin-skinned defenses of the perception of a very political, very partisan, I would argue really radicalized segment of the current makeup of the United States Supreme Court. But I think what he doesn't count on is that the media will not be afraid, right? They won't back down. And these are the facts that he's trying to run away from. This is the laziness of his attack on the, on the press after these stories came out about the flags flown at his property. This is from the Washington Post, quote, Alito told Fox News reporter Shannon Bream that the neighborhood dispute began when his wife went to speak with their neighbor, Emily Baden, in January of 21. Martha Ann Alito was upset that the woman was displaying an anti-Trump sign with an expletive, quote, within 50 feet of where children await the school bus, as Shannon Bream put it on X, formerly Twitter. But Fairfax County schools were shuttered at the time because of COVID and had been since March of 2020. All but a tiny handful of students were learning virtually. Students didn't return to the classroom until February 16th, 2021, after the flag episode occurred. So again, um, a timeline that is only central because it's a timeline that was offered by Samuel Alito in an interview with Shannon Bream of Fox News doesn't appear to be truthful. There are a lot of facts that just don't line up in Justice Alito's story. And I think we can all assume that he went to Shannon Bream because he wouldn't receive the proper pushback to this timeline. And now the timeline is coming out. Uh, you know, following on what Harry was saying earlier, Justice Alito wrote a letter to Congress about his version of events of which he was a key witness. This wasn't just something that his wife did on his own. He was there as a witness, and he wrote in his own words to Congress what he said happened. And now the neighbor is disputing a few key facts. Number one, when the flag went up, and number two, who actually instigated this incident. And what I would be worried about if I were Justice Alito is that there is a police report documenting a version of events. Um, I think more of this is going to come out, but clearly what they were counting on is that the neighbor would remain so intimidated uh, that she wouldn't speak out and give her version of events. And, you know, sort of speaking of thin skinned, you know, just because a neighbor may have used vile language, which I don't think anybody would support, she doesn't even stand by herself, shouldn't be so triggering as for the Supreme Court justice's wife and himself to become involved in an altercation where the police were required to be called. And then on top of that, if we're going into what Congress should be exercising some amount of oversight of, is the neighbor's allegation or suspicion that the Secret Service may have relayed the names of the neighbors to the Alitos? I mean, there is more of a story there and threads that Congress certainly should be pulling upon to find out the real story. Um, that's so intriguing. I mean, Ryan, Ryan Goodman um, tweets this, Justice Alito's letter explaining his refusal to recuse in the January 6th cases may include false statements to Congress. Um, Ian, wh what would change the status quo, which is that the Democratic senators on the Judiciary Committee seem publicly and privately to feel pretty limited in their tools to do anything about any of this. Um, John Roberts seems to be, I don't know what he's doing, um, self-soothing, um, wanting it all to go away. I'm really not sure. Um, and with an immunity decision in the pipeline, I can't imagine that there are going to be fewer eyes looking at this court's makeup. Um, anytime soon. Um, what is, what is, or is there a remedy? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the only thing that can change the status quo is a new Congress, is, is a Democratic majority in both the House and the Senate. I, I mean, the Senate Judiciary Committee could hold a hearing, and then there, you know, maybe there'd be some news coverage of it, and there'd be some political theater, and maybe people could change their minds. But that's it. Like, the, the only thing you can do when you only control one House of Congress is stage some political theater. If you want any kinds of reforms, and there's lots of things that Congress can do, 
do. You know, everything from adding new seats to the court, to stripping the Supreme Court of some of its jurisdiction, to stripping it from some of some of its budget. Lots of things Congress can do if it can actually pass laws. But if you want to change the status quo, if you want the Supreme Court to be less powerful and you want the democratically elected branches of government to assert their power, you have to have a majority in Congress that's willing to do so, and you have to have a president that's willing to sign the bill. And so ultimately, what becomes of this will be determined by the outcome of the November election.